I'd like to introduce our next speaker. Kevin Hirsch is an agrologist, journalist, and farmer. Kevin and his wife Marlene run Hirsch Consulting and Communications based in Saskatoon. Kevin writes a weekly newspaper column for the Western Producer and serves as editor for the bi-monthly magazine Agri Success, published by Farm Credit Canada. He also serves as executive director for the Saskatchewan Mustard Development Commission and Canary Seed Development Commission of Saskatchewan and the Inland Terminal Association of Canada. Kevin and Marlene own and operate Hirsch Farms, Inc. in southwestern Saskatchewan and grow a wide array of crops. Please join, in, join me in welcoming Kevin to Brandon this morning. Well, thanks very much, Darren. It's my pleasure to be here. Ag Days is extremely well organized, especially the speaking parts of it, and uh, it's due to the, the efforts of uh, Darren and Roy and Sharon and all the other folks involved there. When we look back and forth at topics, you know, this is what we, what we came to, how to be a successful mid-sized farm. And of course, that, that, it makes an interesting topic, but it has, of course, uh, then the, the question becomes, what exactly, what the heck's a medium-sized farm? Anybody got any definition out there? What, what's a medium-sized farm? And I guess, you know, oftentimes, if we're in the grain industry, we come up with a, an acre. I'm out. 1,500 acres, 2,000 acres, 2,500 acres, whatever, and it's different in different parts of the country. And I would I would suggest that you know for purposes of, of this presentation, it's really more important what your gross income is, and that's a better measure of the size of a farm than how many acres. Is $500,000 the right amount to say, well, that's where a medium star farm starts? It doesn't really matter, I guess, for definitions. Most of the information I'm going to provide will have value to, you know, will be something to think about whether you're small, medium, or large, so I'm not going to get too hung up in, on what medium is. But, you know, you look at that, and this is Manitoba Ag's projections and what they're using, 55 bushels an acre, 675, so 1,350 acres in Manitoba on average by this would be uh, $500,000 gross. On canola, $11 a bushel, 40 bushel an acre is what they're using for their projections, a little less. So if you're 12, 13, 1,400 uh, acres, you're, you're in that half million gross area. But look what, it, look what it takes if you're in the cow-calf industry. Let's say you're selling your 550 pound weight calves in the fall. Last year's price was 220 on steers and you've got to make some assumptions about your percentage calf crop and some uh, hold back of replacement heifers, you probably need 450 head to make a half million dollars gross in a cow-calf operation. And I don't know how it is around here, but back home if you've got 12 or 13 or 1400 acres, you're not a very big farm. I'm, I'm 1500 acre farm, I'm small potatoes in southwest Saskatchewan where I farm, but if you've got a herd of 450 cows, you get to wear a pretty big hat on Coffee Row. That's a, that's a pretty significant cow-calf operation. So I think that, you know, when we start talking about what's large, small, and medium, we should be looking at gross income, and it, it really varies depending what you're doing and where you're doing it. Challenges if you're smaller. And this is, you know, I should have some discussions with some of the f people selling farm real estate, farm, farm real estate companies here that have trade show booths, but I wish that land was offered in smaller chunks because more and more I'm seeing land offered, you know, here's the deal, buy 10 quarters, buy 15 quarters, buy 36 quarters of land. We want to we wanna bid on the whole schmear. Well, if you're a smaller farm operator, maybe you'd be interested in a quarter, maybe you'd be interested in a half, maybe you'd be able, even able to pay a premium for that if it's adjacent to your operation, but you're in no position to step out and buy 10 quarters at a go, and oftentimes you're seeing parcels being offered in larger chunks that makes it very difficult to get out expansion. I'm not sure how much volume discounts people get on purchase of chemicals or fertilizer anymore. I know this was a big thing way back. Um, you know, I don't play in that game, so I'm not sure. I think it, it does exist on the other side, though, where they need to fill a boat or they need to fill a train and they're looking for a particular quality of grain and they know such and such has got 10,000 or 20,000 bushels and they can make one call and solve their problem with a, with a small price premium. So I think there are some premiums and some discounts that apply to some of the larger operations. And I find this all the time. It's tough to justify some of the new technology that I think that would, I'd like to have that I think could make me more money and make me more efficient. But when you're dealing with a smaller acreage and a smaller cash flow, that makes it difficult to do. But I do think that small to medium-sized operations also have some advantages. And 
if you look at some of the large operations, and I don't know what the size of farms are in, in Manitoba, what you consider big here, but 10, 15, 20,000 acres is no longer very big in many parts of Saskatchewan where there's 40 and 60 and 100,000 acre operations. And the person that's ahead of that probably doesn't do much tractor time and much combine time, if any. They're driving around in a truck making sure everything else is running and they're on the phone and they're on their email and they're managing. And most of us didn't sign up for that. Most of us understand the management, want to do the management, but we want to be more hands-on in the operation and make sure things are done correctly. And that's possible with a more moderate-sized operation. We're not as throughput-oriented. I look at some of my large farming neighbors and they got to do things simple as far as their crop mix. They want to be able to have only a few crops, spray them all with the same thing, they want to be in and out with their farming operation. It's a track meet to get over all of the land they're doing. I'd rather try to do a good job and be a little more creative rather than just being a track meet and, and seeing how we can do logistically with everything. I think that the opportunity exists if you're not pushing the large, large scale to be a little more creative and look for some more value-added opportunities. And we'll talk about a few of those suggestions today. And I think there's also significant savings in time to be had from not having to run 20 miles this way and 30 miles that way and then 15 miles the other way because you've got parcels of land all over creation to create your large farm. That most of the people that are small to medium size may have land that's more contiguous, more adjacent, and certainly that's our case and we're able to make some equipment adjustments because we don't have to run long distances to spray uh, a half section or a quarter or a section that's way the heck and gone away from everything else. So our motto is trying to specialize in specialty crops on this little farm operation down in southwest Saskatchewan, down in the desert. That's supposed to be an antelope on the logo. I farm near Kibri. Kibri is actually a Cree word for antelope, and there's lots of antelope herds down there, but it's also the desert down there some years, and, and uh, certainly different than most of the situations in Manitoba. This shows that I have absolutely no shame when it comes to farm equipment. And I, and I think that's maybe important when it comes to being a small to medium sized operation. And this, uh, you know, in this case, a flex header, a John Deere 930F flex header was the best option on those old 8570 Massey combines. Massey did make a flex header, but they were more rare, tougher to get parts for, and we operate a couple of these flex headers and have for quite some time. That old combine's getting pretty old, that was getting up towards 5,000 hours, so it's now become pretty much the spare combine. But the first year of the 8780 model Massey also fits those 930F John Deere headers that are modified to fit that and we've got a, a honeybee header because you know just pinning up those flex headers wasn't good on some crops that's a that's a crop of brown mustard that's going in it might look pretty small for you guys but that was actually our our best crop last year new technology Seeding a variety of crops would like to have on-row depth control. That's expensive, that's relatively new technology. Can a small farm afford it? This is actually a, a little manufacturing company called Keyheart that makes this sort of drill that has on-row on depth control. It's a big investment for a little farm to make, but made the investment and then messed around and got a, a cart that would work with it, and that was a used cart to try to make it work with it, and that was a bit trying and a, a long story. But as often is the case, there we are thinking we've got the problem solved, but then we discover in the first year of operation that that old versatile 875, while it's been a great tractor and we've put all the bells and whistles we could on it, and even with the Atom Jet hydraulics, it really doesn't have enough hydraulics, it really doesn't have enough oomph, that larger cart. So then to know what the next thing is you do, you buy a new old tractor a newer old tractor and you're, you're down the, the road to more investment in farm equipment than you had originally planned. Then we have a, you know, an entry level high clearance sprayer because we do a lot, of, a lot of things with crops that need uh, fungicide applications. Maybe for a farm of our size we should try to be getting away with a pole type sprayer but have the entry level Apache, gets lots of hours on it. Uh, the local dealer in Swift Current, uh, there was suddenly no local Apache dealer anymore. It was time to upgrade. So you upgrade to something slightly larger. Uh, it's about the same size tank in this, in this spray coop, and both of them are, are 90 foot, but a little more horsepower, a little faster. But again, it's easy to keep upgrading, and suddenly your equipment investment is overblown. 
We don't own a semi. We don't have our own uh, grain hauling, and I know this is something a lot of people wouldn't be without. In our case, it doesn't make any sense. A lot of our specialty crops are going all the way here into Manitoba, or they're going north three or four hours from the farm, or they're going down into even sometimes into the U.S. So one of my goals in life is not to drive big trucks through cities, and so everything is custom hauled. And we do own a Tritum, but it's pulled behind the tractor at, at harvest time. You know, at, at 10 mile an hour, it would be a, a long trip to get to Winnipeg with this. With this. But where roads hardly exist and, and road rules hardly exist, we can tow this up and down the road. And, and of course, we never overload it, and that we never do that. And that's a, that's a load of uh, Kabuli chickpeas in there, which is one of our main crops. But there you see a couple of conveyors. And conveyors are more expensive than augers, but if you're going to do some of the specialty crops for breakage and ease of clean out and other things, that's an extra investment. I really believe that one of the things that isn't given enough attention is our farm machinery costs. So equipment investment per acre. I would urge you, how many people know how much, what their equipment investment per acre is? How many people have it as a top of mind number? There's, there's a few hands out there. I think it's something everybody should do the calculation. SaskAg, quoting Statistics Agriculture or Statistics Canada numbers, says in the brown soil zone it averages $330 an acre. In the black soil zone it's $422 an acre. Manitoba Agriculture, in its uh, in crop planning guides, a crop production costs guide, they have a whole list of equipment, and they've added it all up. And they, their assumption is $682 in conventional equipment, $86 in specialty crop equipment. Now, they're just going off a list of equipment, and everybody should put their own numbers in there. But my point is, there's a great variation in farmers that are doing the same thing and how much equipment investment per acre they have. And the important thing is, what is your numbers? And some people say, what do I do about, I got some leased equipment, what do I do? How do I, how do I put that in the equation? Just put it in the equation for its current market value. Because whether or not you own it or whether you're leasing it, you end up paying about the same thing at the end of the day. It might be slight advantage one way or the other, but it's about the same cost. So add up all of your equipment, divide by the number of your cropped acres and see where you, see where you come out. Now, so, so how much of this ends up as a cost? Okay, you got your machinery investment per acre, how much is it cost? Well, SaskAg in its guide uses 7.5% machinery investment cost, which I think is a little bit high. I usually typically think a value of money at 5%. They're using 7.5%. They're using straight line depreciation of 10.7% and repair costs that they put in operating costs of 2.6%. So they say 20.8% of your machinery cost per acre should be an annual cost. Manitoba agriculture is doing somewhat differently. So in Saskatchewan, $422 an acre in the black soil zone is the average equipment investment, and that probably ranges from $250 to $800, but at that average level, that equates to an annual cost of $88 an acre. Now, Manitoba agriculture. They assume loan payments on 50% of the machinery value over 10 years. They put depreciation, it only works out to 3.3%, and I had some discussions with Roy Arnott about how they come up with that, and I'm, I'm, I, would, I would argue that your depreciation cost is higher than that, and then they put in a $10 an acre operating cost for things like repair. So for them, on the conventional side of $682 an acre, equates to about $77 an acre. Jonathan Small, who is a farm management specialist who I really enjoy his analysis, used to work for MNP, now is with Global Agris Solutions. You'll see some of his uh, webinars. He says that depreciation should be 15%, repairs 5%, cost of money at 5 for a total of 25%. So when you add up your machinery cost per acre, somewhere between 15 or 20 or 25% of that, depending upon your assumptions, should be your annual cost. And maybe it doesn't show up in your balance sheet necessarily or in your profit and loss sheet, but at the end of the day, this is money that has to come from somewhere. So my point is that there's a big difference in machinery operating costs and depending upon your equipment investment per acre. And I think it's a number everybody should know. And it, you, could be, you could be 50 or 60 or $80 an acre different than your neighbor because you're over-equipped. 
Now, being under-equipped can be a cost, too. If you don't get things done on a timely basis and the crops laying out there not seeded in time, not sprayed in time, that's a cost, too. But it's pretty easy, I think, to be over-invested because we always want to make that next step up. And as you, you know, it's rare for me to get invited to speak at a farm machinery show with views like this, obviously. It's not, it's not, it's not the popular, popular point of view. But take a look, this is Manitoba Agriculture, this is Alberta Agriculture numbers, and some of these were shown in a different graph uh, uh, earlier presentation, but this is a, a small self-propelled combine, or just a class 7 small combine. Back in 2014 it was worth 360000 and now it's about $505,000, that's before you put a header on the thing. That's a, that's a heck of a run up in price on a small combine in a matter of five years. So the point is, maybe your equipment, you think it isn't depreciating that much. I would argue that a, a combine goes down in value really darn quick. A four-wheel drive tractor holds its value pretty good. But God help you when, you when it comes time to trade up. You might think that the value hasn't decreased that much, but that's because what you're going to trade into has also gone up. So I know some producers that are out there just putting a, a, a caveat they put X amount of money per acre aside knowing they're going to have to pay equipment costs and upgrade it sometime. So that's, that's one of the points I wanted to make today. I am an advocate of grain and fertilizer storage as a way to make money. I don't have qualms about investing in equipment, about investing in, in grain and in fertilizer storage. And I'm not sure whether you can, you can see this, but this again is from Alberta Agriculture that charts farm input costs and publishes on a monthly basis. But if you study this, when does the price of urea 4600 typically peak? It typically peaks, not every year, but it typically goes up a heck of a pile in the April to May time period every year just before seeding. In some years, like if you look at 2014 and how the price peaked going into the spring and in that first line in 2014, you could have paid for a lot of fertilizer storage in one year by just having that on-farm storage if you'd have bought at the high versus, or bought at the low versus buying at the high. On grain storage considerations, I'm in a situation in southern Saskatchewan where a lot of prices have gone to heck in a handbasket. Kabuli chickpeas have gone from 60 cents to 27 cents. Durham is a steep discount to spring wheat. Um, mustard prices have gone down. I've stopped growing lentils, but they're, they're at a disappointing price level. Many of the crops in southern Saskatchewan are at disappointing price levels. A lot of people are storing, hoping for better times. Well, which ones do you store? Which ones do you have to blow out because you can't store everything? I think we, you, there's more analysis needs to be given this. You need to look at the historical price range. The commodity you're looking at storage, is it near the bottom? Has it been sitting at the bottom for quite some time? Might it be doing time for a, for a comeback? And of course, it's still judged by your, your cash flow and your storage capacity. These are not endless things, so you still have to have a plan of something you're going to sell. What is storage cost per year? Alberta Agriculture did some interesting analysis on this, assuming four to 5,000 bushel hopper bins and salvage value and over a period of years and did some number crunching, they came up with around 25 cents a bushel. Well, who might argue? That, not, that assumes you use it every year, not, not that it sits vacant a bunch of time. So interest costs, I would say you should use 5%. If you're, if you're storing canola, for instance, and it's around $10 a bushel, that's 50 cents in a year. So if, you're, if, you're, if your upside isn't 75 cents on a bushel of canola in a year, why would you be storing it? So I think you've got to look and, and see which grains have the upside, but I do think that storing can make sense and that it's one of the advantages we have in Western Canada that they don't have in many other regions of the world. We have way more farm storage than most of our competitors. Now this isn't my farm, this is just a, a farmyard shot taken off the internet. And, but the point is, and I, I always, you know, I always hesitate here because you can get yourselves into trouble talking about these things. And I'd get myself into trouble if my wife knew I was showing a picture of her cutting grass at the farm. But sometimes I don't think we're using all of our family labor to its ultimate. And I don't, want to, I don't want to be stereotypical here, but oftentimes, a lot of the yard maintenance, the having a really big garden, falls on the females in 
the farming operation. And do you, if, you, if you want to have a farmyard that's absolutely pristine and, and should be making the cover of magazines because it's so damn nice, good for you. But realize that comes at a large cost of time and effort. And if you were doing it on a real cold, hard balance sheet thing, first of all, does that person really want to have that big garden and that beautiful yard? And if they do, have you bought them the best tools so they can do it without all using all of their time? We've got friends, we've got a little cabin on the South Saskatchewan River, and we, I try to get there now and then in the summertime. My wife spends quite a bit of time there. We've got friends we'd like to see there, but they often don't make it on the weekends because they're too busy doing their yard work. It's because their yard is absolutely beautiful. Now, that's fine if that's your priority and that's what you want to do. But sometimes I think some of those people should be asked, maybe you want to divert your attention to something else. Maybe we want a yard that's a little more minimum maintenance because it can be a full-time frickin' job of a lot of hard work trying to make a yard that's pretty. And I like fresh tomatoes and fresh carrots as well as anybody. But by the same token, a big, a big garden, especially if you're hauling hoses, pulling hoses rather than having underground water or something, it's a big frickin' job. And I'm not sure that sometimes these things just get passed down from generation to generation or it's how we've always done it. But when labor is in short supply and you're looking at really what the, the cost of this is, I think it can be onerous. So the little farm operation we have grows a variety of crops. Uh, chickpeas, flaxseed, sometimes together as an intercrop. Brown mustard was our most profitable crop last year. We had really bad conditions, really dry conditions last year, so things did not go very well. We've grown large green lentils in the past. We've got out of them right now because the price is terrible. Grow canary seed from time to time. We uh, do maple peas, which is a specialty pea and hyaluronic acid rapeseed sometimes when the prices looked attractive and it looks like it could work for us. So we're, we'll grow a range of things and then you have to have a cereal in the rotation. So even though I don't like to be a Durham grower, sometimes I'm a Durham grower. And right now the price is a severe discount. Maple peas. Anybody in this crowd ever grow maple peas? Yeah, a little bit. These are the, uh, this is... <laughs> The variety that's been around for a long time and still is the preferred variety lodges badly. This is about 2014. There was three to four inches of rain just before we tried to combine these things. They were already flat to the ground and that's how much dust was coming out of them when we were putting them in the bin. It was not a lot of fun. So last year when we grew them, we intercropped them with barley. And agronomically, I think it worked reasonably well. There's things I'd do differently if I was to do it again, but one of the mistakes I made is that you would think the seed size of those is enough different that you could easily separate it. It was not easy. I could run them through the cleaner, my clipper cleaner, and they would still be 5% barley. I had to get let down to less than one half of 1% barley. So that meant running them through the old clipper cleaner and then borrowing slash renting a set of spirals and the peas roll faster than the barley so this separated them quite well but this is 150 bushels an hour this did you know this i thought i was going to die of old age before we got this done but i am an advocate of intercropping and i believe especially for uh, small to medium sized producers that it, it can be an advantage. I believe you have to pick a dominant crop and a helper crop and have a reason for the helper crop. In this case, the barley was there to keep the Acer chickpeas from lodging. In a, in a case of chickpea flax, the idea is to try to keep some of the disease out of the chickpeas and some of the research showing that you can really cut your fungicide applications if you've got a bit of flax in there. You need to figure out weed control and make sure that you can control weeds in both of the crops together. Here's the rule I broke. The seeds should be easily separable. I should have checked this out with some screens before I just assumed that this was going to be possible. Crop maturity should match. You don't want one shelling out and sitting there mature while the other one's still green. And a lot of people are believing their soil benefits to intercropping, to multi-cropping, to polycropping. Maybe, intuitively that would be the case, but I think the economics will be far easier to measure than the health benefits or the health soil benefits going forward. This is chickpeas flax from a few years ago. Again, this was a darn dry year, so not a very good crop. And I quit doing this one.
because brassica weeds. Stinkweed, wild mustard, I got no way to control them when I put the two crops together. I can control them in flax, I can control them in chickpeas, put the two crops together and you don't have any herbicide options that work for brassica weeds anymore. But I've got a cattle farming neighbor that's got land or he doesn't have a brassica weed problem, but he needs to grow some green feed. So the idea is we're going to trade some acres in the upcoming year. I'm going to grow some uh, chickpea flax intercrop in some of his land. I'm going to give him some of my land and, and seed some green feed, probably uh, smooth on barley for his use. My land suffers from not having enough cereals in the rotation because I typically the, the lowest value thing. So let him grow some, he needs to be able to grow some green feed. I would rather have some virgin land to grow some chickpea flax on. So we'll see how this works. I believe there's a lot more cooperation possible between grain and cattle operations, especially those of a moderate size, and sometimes we don't explore all of the things that we could be doing and all the advantages that are possible out there. Cover crops aren't big in my area. In higher moisture areas, they certainly are, and I think as soon as you start growing cover crops on your land, trying to keep a cover and stop soil erosion and try to, you know, influence bacteria in the soil and do all those good things, then you almost need a livestock component, I think, to make that a real paying proposition. And I think as we look, if you just, we need to talk between grain and cattle more. I think there's more and more win-win relationships out there. But certainly, like everybody else, farms are getting bigger, grain farms are getting bigger. This is the number of cattle farms, according to the census of ag, going back to 1961. Now, the number of cattle is, you know, similar to 81, similar to 61. Those cattle were, we have now were, are bigger than they were back then, so we're probably producing more beef than we were back then. But certainly the number of cattle farms is declining rapidly. How many people here have cattle back home? Okay, good, good sprinkling. How many people have hogs on, the, on their place? How many hog farmers in the place? Yeah, not, not very many. In Saskatchewan, hog farmers can hold an annual meeting in a phone booth if we had phone booths anymore. And, and the hog operations that exist there are, are typically larger operations integrated with, uh, with uh, packing plants. The Ma and Pa hog farm operation is almost a thing of the past in Saskatchewan, but I know still does exist in, in Manitoba. Here's, a, here's what's happened with the number of incorporated farms going back to 1991. You see more and more farms are incorporated. And the previous speaker, Lance Stockruger, Lance and I have known each other for years and years, and he's, he's a chartered accountant that I'm, I'm certainly not, but I don't necessarily agree with him on all of the things relating to corporations. Like, he, he's quite right. You know, the tax saving in a corporation is just a deferral. It's just a deferral. Well, you know, death is certain too, just like taxes, but I'd rather defer death too if I could. So I still think there's ways to get your money out of the corporation, but he makes a number of good points. My point would be that some operations grow to become medium-sized operations, and they hear all this stuff about, oh, God, corporations cost a whole bunch of money, and there's this and there's that, and you, you can't get your money out of them. Get good advice. I see a lot of operations that I know are doing a fair degree of money and have a fair degree of retained earnings. They need to have discussions about their structure and whether being in a corporate structure might be an advantage to them for succession planning, for immediate tax savings, for a whole range of things. Our little farm has been incorporated for, oh, eight or nine years now. A little 1,500-acre farm down in the desert of southwest Saskatchewan and wouldn't have it any other way. So, I'm my, you know, again, my, my message is a little bit counterintuitive to what Lance was telling everybody. I think we have to take a firm look at our business risk management, no matter what the size of your farm operation is. And I won't ask for a show of hands, but everywhere I go, I hear people that have said they got the heck out of agri-stability because they couldn't figure out how they were ever going to get a payment. And they say crop insurance is our first line of defense. Crop insurance is a good program. Just reading the news release came out of here yesterday. 90% of the farmland in Manitoba is covered by crop insurance, far higher than other provinces. They've added a number of enhancements for this year. Good for them. Crop insurance is a great program. Is agri-stability still worth the, the, the effort and expense? Well, a bunch of accountants say it will, but they get paid for doing your forms and sending them in. So can you trust the buggers? Well... I, I tend to believe that agri-stability may still have a place. 
Trouble is, it's, it's complicated, not considered bankable. They've looked at how they, what it could be replaced with. I believe that maybe we should be marrying this to some of the private insurance programs out there, and together we can make a better program. But if you think you're never going to claim, well, here's what I had a, what I thought was a pretty good plan going into 2018. I had the first 10 bushels of brown mustard contracted at 38 cents, which is a good price. Hell of a deal. Yeah, okay, but the other 10 bushels I produced, the price is down to 30 cents. So there's, there's one of the crops I'm probably going to store for a while. What about kabuli chickpeas? Well, I know these can go up and down. The price was 60 cents, but I knew the price could go down. I contracted them at 45 cents on the first 10 bushels. Boy, am I smart. Well, the company I contracted with went out of business. That contract is absolutely useless. The price now is 27 cents a pound. In fact, I sold one load, I'm not very proud of, at 22 or 23 cents a pound right back last fall. I had maple peas contracted at $13 a bushel with uh, those... Uh, with those uh, barley in there when I finally got them separated, but yields were poor. So uh, yeah, I produced the 10 bushels an acre at $13. I'm gonna sell the rest at $15.50, but there's not much of a rest to sell because we had a poor darn year. The Durham wasn't contracted. Durham prices have gone to hell in a handbasket. They've actually improved a little bit now, but yields were poor. So you look at this, had a heck of a plan, heck of a plan, just came back from the accountants yesterday. I'm in the money for agri-stability. Crop insurance is good protection most of the time, but it's not price protection. So you got, let's say crop insurance is going to guarantee you a 30 bushel crop at $11 a bushel. And you grow a 30 bushel crop. You're right on your crop insurance. You had a bad year, you only grow that 30 bushel, but now the price of canola goes to $8. Do you have any protection for that? You don't get nothing from crop insurance. You brew your 30 bushels. It's production insurance, it's not price insurance. And we forgot that over a number of good years in the industry. So I think that everybody needs to look at, at the various options. One of the options that I think is worth looking at, maybe it isn't for you or isn't for you yet, is Global Ag Risk Solutions. And I've been in and out of this and I, I examine it every year to see what it will do for my farm operation. So it covers your seed, fertilizer, and chemicals. In my case, it would cover up to $177 an acre, which is more than I'm likely to spend unless I spend a whole bunch of money on fungicide for chickpeas. And then you buy margin above that. So if I wanted to buy margin coverage of $175 an acre above seed, fertilizer, and chemicals, the cost is pretty expensive, $25 an acre. But that's basically my break-even. This was last year's quote. I haven't got a quote for 2018 yet. And it all depends on your numbers and your accrual financial statements as to what they will insure you for. So I'm not, I'm not pretending these are anybody else's numbers. Won't even be my numbers for 2019. But I basically could have spent $25 an acre, which would have been a hard check to write. But I basically would have ensured that at the end of the day, my revenue, my gross revenue, would be at least $175 over seed, chem, and fert. If I want to buy a smaller margin, less cost, want to get basic protection, less cost, and then you can decide whether or not you, in, you buy some level of crop insurance with this, whether you buy some level of hail insurance with this. All I'm saying is everybody's answer is different, but don't forget your business risk management and don't forget to look at some other options out there. For the livestock producers in the crowd out there, I'm actually envious of your livestock price insurance program where you can lock in a minimum price in case all heck breaks loose out there. And don't, don't forget what happened when we had BSE. Don't forget what we could have with some trade as, as things that happen out there with the administration we have in the U.S., with all the things that go on in the industry. I'm not saying you have to pay a whole bunch of money for this, but when you're able to put a base amount on what your cows will be worth in the fall, man, I think that's a great program. A very simple program. I wish governments could cost share it with livestock producers, because it isn't cost shared. It's, a, it's basically you're paying the full cost of this over time, and I think it's a, it's a great program. Here's some more of these chickpeas that don't always work out. This is 2016 when it actually wouldn't quit raining. Never thought we'd see that in southwest Saskatchewan. When it doesn't quit raining, chickpeas don't want to mature. They just keep growing and keep growing. A bunch of them ended up in bales for the neighbors. But nice to have neighbors, they at least could use them. And some of the chickpeas we harvested, they're supposed to look like this. 
You know why they call them a chickpea? If you look real hard on that, you'll see a little beak, like a little chick on the, on the, on the round part of that. And that's why they're called a chickpea. These are what Kabuli chickpeas are garbanzo beans. You see them in salad bars. You eat them in hummus. This is what they're supposed to look like. In 2016, some of them look like that. And you might go, well, gee, that's, that's ugly. Yeah, that's really ugly. I didn't think I could sell them for pig feed. You know what I ended up? I ended up selling them to the pet food market in the U.S. for 34 cents a pound picked up on the farm. Right now, top quality is only worth 27 cents. So we have to realize that there are some markets out there, including the pet food market, that we'll pay the price. It is a big market. It is a premium market. I also ran into a, I was at a meeting in Alberta and this really came home. And there was a guy there that had long had a feeder pig barn and he'd worked really hard at it and, but hadn't made a lot of money. He was tied into a larger operation and they had a deal. And the, the barn was just about worn out now, but he had it paid off. But you could tell that it hadn't been a real money maker, but also in the crowd, with somebody that him and his wife raised some crossbreed of dog, some cockapoodle thingamajiggy that I don't even know, but, but they, they were in the right place, had good health standards, knew what they were doing, had a really good website. They sold about 50 dogs a year at $2,500 a pop. And how much would their investment be for that, making that $100,000 a year? Not very much. So sometimes you have to, you have to look at it will actually make you money. Organic, as you can see, the, actually the number of organic farms from 2011 to 2016 dropped. And I know sometimes some of the people say that that's actually picked up again in 2017 and 2018. I'm not a, I'm not a big lover of organic. You know, a farm my operation, size this operation, trying to go higher value stuff, organic might be a logical choice. Philosophically, I'm just not there. I don't believe that organic is any safer or any better. And I think it, it comes with a, a number of problems. But it is a legitimate business option. The demand is growing. The premium prices, the three-year transition makes it difficult to get into. But here's a tip for you. If you're a grain and livestock producer and you've got a bunch of pasture land, grazing land, uh, hay land coming out of production, you might be able to get that certified organic if, it, if, you, if you do it well in advance of breaking it up and you haven't used any inputs on it for a number of years, you can get that certified organic and your first couple of crops off that, you can sell into the organic market potentially. Take some paperwork, take some certification, you have to see if it's worthwhile for you, but it is, it is a reasonable option for some people. One of the hints I told, somebody told me once, there is no average organic producers. There's people that sort of are subsistence and get by, and then there's some people that are doing just a bang-up job of marketing and production and, and crop rotation, and they're doing a heck of a job. There isn't a, a large number in between those two extremes. Age distribution, well, I ended the old, I got into the old fart category quite a few years ago now. And there is a little bit of an uptick in uh, the last census of producers that are under 35 years old. But I see no end of young producers that are interested in getting into farming. I see their farming parents probably farming later in life than they otherwise would. And we don't always do a good job, I think, of, of succession plans and, and planning. Written succession plans are a bit of a rarity. And the thing is, you might have what you think is a medium-large farm now, but what happens if you start farming with a son or a daughter and there's suddenly two families getting their income off the farm? That suddenly makes it from a large farm to a medium farm. And that's the situation for many people when they start farming with their, with their kids or, their, or others. And then there's the definition of success. As a young generation coming on, you know, his best success might be if he falls off right away. But sometimes I think we, we try to measure it all with money. And success, in my, my view, isn't all money. And, you know, we, most of us can hearken back to our roots. I'm, I'm third generation. There will be people in this crowd that are fourth and fifth generation, maybe more than that, being from Manitoba. And we started from pretty freaking meager times. You know, a sod hut, you see sod on the top and, uh, and tar paper on the sides of that shack. I imagine the wind whistled through that pretty good on the bald prairie in southwest Saskatchewan. And sometimes, sometimes I think we psych ourselves out because we hear somebody's farming 5,000 acres or 10,000 acres or 20,000 acres. God, we're, we're never going to be that big. 
And we, oh, that's a terrible thing. And, you, and, you, and you, the game is played. You know, you're 55 or 60 years old and somebody, the big farmer from down the road comes by and says, you know, I could buy you guys out. You guys might as well just retire. Your farm's really not big enough to be, you know, to be on a go-forward basis. You know, take, take the money and, and go retire. Get, get a nice place somewhere. Your, your kids aren't going to want it either. You wouldn't want to saddle them with that. You've just got too small of a farm operation here. Well, my comment to that would, to hell with you. If, you know, if I'm making money, if I'm happy doing what I'm doing, there's all sorts of equipment, there's all sorts of ways to get more revenue per acre, and off-farm income is important. Many of us work off-farm and do some things off-farm. I don't have to draw much of any income from the farm because I've got consulting income coming in. And that gives me an advantage in, in the marketplace. And if he was a really big farmer, really big farmers tend to have less off-farm income. They don't have the time or the ability to go do that. So be happy what you're doing, and, and success isn't always money. You've got three boys. Um, all three of them will come down to the farm and work from time to time. The oldest guy that's an actor, you know, when he doesn't have an acting gig, the farm looks like a real good thing. I don't know what succession is going to look like, but success to me is being able to work with my family, make a, make a few dollars, and, and enjoy what we're doing. So in conclusion, trying to wrap this up, watch your equipment cost per acre. And if you do one thing, if I can ask you to do one thing, go back home tonight and pull out your insurance records or pull out your income tax or just make a list off the top of your head and estimate what your equipment cost per acre is. I wish we had a benchmark on this. I wish we really knew what average was. But if it comes out on dry land at six or seven or eight hundred dollars an acre, you might be you might be high and it's costing you money. If you if you're two hundred dollars an acre, well, good for you. But do you have enough invested that you're getting the work done on a, on a timely basis? But I think this is an important sleeper that's not measured on a lot of farms, and especially medium-sized farms can get into trouble with this. Storage can be a good investment, I believe that grain storage and fertilizer storage done right can make you money. Now you can put grain into storage, save it for five years and then sell for lower than it went in at. There's ways to mess this up. You gotta be, gotta be strategic about it, but if you do it properly, storage can be a good investment. Utilize your family labor to the best, best advantage. There might be extended family members that are quite happy to come back with, and help with seeding and harvest. Could be a heck of a deal, they could really enjoy that. Maybe, maybe you shouldn't be doing the big garden. Maybe the, the yard doesn't have to be quite as pristine. Decide what the priorities are. Is that really what you want to be doing? Look for higher value cropping options. I am excited about the potential of intercropping, not only as a way to get more production, but as a way to save costs, specifically fungicide costs on chickpeas. I think for some people, organic and going going the route of what the market is going to want to demand for us from us is going to provide more and more opportunities. Pay attention to risk management. Yeah, make sure you've got the, your, you understand your crop insurance, what it does and what it doesn't do. If you're going to drop out of agri-stability, make sure you're dropping out for the right reasons. Look at some of the private insurance offerings and what they can supply to you and whether they have a place in your operation. Just understand it better. And finally, Success, at the end of the day, isn't just money. If we're happy and healthy and our family is harmonious, that's about as, as good as you can get. What's good gets better than that. They say that uh, money, you can't take it with you. Well, I guess maybe that's not entirely true now. At least for people like me, it's not entirely true because they say there's ATMs all over hell. <laughs> but, but for most of us, you can't take it with you. So what, at the end of the day, what's more important, the biggest bank account or a family that's well-adjusted and harmonious and having had some good times and maybe having something to pass on to the next generation? Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for being such a kind audience. I'll be kicking around the back if anybody wants to chat. All the best. <laughs>